Lightning Network completely changes the uh, scaling game. It changes it because now we can start talking about millions and millions and millions of transactions per second, um, which you can't even conceive of with a block size increase. A block size increase can push the can down the road, um, but you don't change scaling by orders of magnitude with block size increases. It's not possible to do order of magnitude block size increases without fundamentally destroying the decentralization principles of Bitcoin, at least not yet. Um, whereas with Lightning, by taking most of these transactions off-chain and yet retaining the exact same trust model and doing actual Bitcoin transactions with smart contracts, um, Lightning is Bitcoin. It's, it's me exchanging signed Bitcoin transactions with another person without reporting them on the blockchain, because we don't need to unless there's a dispute. And we can do millions of those per second just between the two of us. Forget everybody else in the world. So, um, yes, Lightning Network really does bring enough scaling. It allows us to change the dimensions of Bitcoin. It allows us to reduce the granularity of payments, not just down to millibits, but down to satoshis and even sub-satoshi amounts, which has been demonstrated, by the way. Um, and do that uh, on the scale of millisecond round trips, where we're basically creating and confirming transactions thousands of times per second. Lightning Network is a collection of peers. If you only open one channel and you don't want to route payments, you're not really using Lightning Network. You should be using Lightning Network in a bidirectional fashion, where you're also routing payments. It gives you uh, much more privacy. Um, if you're only connected to a single other Lightning Network node, then it can see all of the transactions coming from you, and it knows you're not connected to anybody else, then um, it can tell that the transactions are yours. If you're connected to somebody else, the transactions could be coming from any number of routes of which you're, you know, hop 19. Um, it's not it's not possible for any of the nodes to know whether you're the originator or simply relaying. Um, so everybody relaying everything is the model, uh, and a mesh network, not a hub and spoke system, is the better, more secure model. And it's actually what the clients implement right now. They'll go out and automatically connect to lots of nodes to give you that kind of mesh connectivity. So there is some security risk in that that system will have keys on it, so it is a hot wallet. Um, and if you're running that hot wallet with a lot of Bitcoin in it, then it's a target for attack, and someone can hack into your Lightning node and can use it to make a payment over Lightning uh, to drain your wallet. So there is a security risk. Uh, there may also be legal risks, uh, and I'm not a lawyer, so I can't really comment. Different countries, different jurisdictions, different states will have different requirements. Um, I would assume that if you do run a Lightning Network node, you should be running it over Tor. Um, and again, I, I don't know. Uh, it depends on your jurisdiction, it depends on your country, it depends on the state of the rule of law in your country. One of the criticisms I've heard myself and seen in a number of videos and medium posts, etc., is the idea that routing on Lightning Network is not a solved problem. And that's absolutely right. Routing is not a solved problem in Lightning Network. In fact, uh, Lightning Network is still under uh, heavy development and is in the very, very early stages um, of development. And most of the clients are still in the beta uh, category, their pre-production software. And even though you can run Lightning on mainnet, it's still not really suitable for production use. There are bugs to iron out. Um, so, what about Lightning routing? The bottom line is that routing is not part of the core specification of Lightning, um, and that's deliberate. And the reason for that is because the routing algorithm is independent of the construction of payment channels, meaning that. There are two broad considerations in Lightning. One is, how do you construct uh, payment channels between two parties that do not require trust? 
and then how do you transmit payments by connecting a number of payment channels together to create a path. That is one set of problems, and that set of problems is um, at the moment specified by a series of standards um, called the BOLT standards. In fact, there are three different uh, types of Lightning Network um, that are defined by three different standards. There is BOLT, uh, which is the basics of Lightning technology, which is one set of standards around which there are a number of implementations. There is LIT, which is a slightly different implementation of payment channels and routing. And then there is Raiden, which you may have heard of, which is on the Ethereum network, which is a, another implementation of the same concept with a different set of specifications. I'll talk about Bolt, which I think is what most people refer to today as the Lightning Network, which is Bolt is the set of standards that allow interoperability between the, uh, the three most common uh, implementations, C Lightning, um, LND, and Eclair. And these three implementations are uh, currently interoperating uh, with a very big network that is growing rather rapidly on mainnet, uh, and testing out the basic concept. Routing at the moment on that network is done in a very simplistic fashion, and that is a mechanism called source routing. The interesting thing about the Lightning specification is that routing is not part of the Lightning specification. It can be handled separately. In fact, like many other internetworks, which is what Lightning Network is, or a network of networks, um, routing is something that happens at a separate layer of the protocol. And there can be multiple independent routing algorithms operating simultaneously. Now, you may have heard of another uh, internetwork. Uh, that has routing as a separate layer, where many routing algorithms operate independently. and That is the internet, of course. In the very early days of the internet, the mechanism used for routing, when the network was small um, and fairly static, was a mechanism called source routing, where each host kept a broad map of what the network looked like, and constructed a path for the packets by encapsulating that path within, um, uh, within each packet. And so it, the source of a transmission on the TCPIP network in the very early days incorporated information into the packet that said, send it to this node, then have that node send it to the next node, then have that node send it to the next node. Um, and that path was specified in advance. Now, Lightning Network uses source routing for now. And the reason for that is because um, it is one of the simplest implementations you can have. There are some criticisms that source routing won't scale. and That is absolutely right. Source routing will not scale. But Lightning Network isn't committed to using just source routing. There are a number of other routing algorithms that could be used. and In fact, many could be used simultaneously. Uh, on the network to optimize for different things, maybe a routing network that optimize, sorry, a routing algorithm that optimizes for privacy or for fees or for the minimum amount of hops or uh, for large payments or small payments. Who knows? This is still an area of active research. There are two or three proposed routing implementations that um, use different uh, structures within the network in order to introduce some level of hierarchical routing, where basically you have uh, nodes that are aware of their immediate environment, meaning the nodes that are most closely connected to them, and um, then they aggregate that information and act as beacons that repeat it to um, adjacent neighborhoods. So this organization of Lightning into neighborhoods uh, with uh, nodes repeating that information across neighborhoods is one proposed uh, approach to routing. And there will be dozens more. Uh, just like today on the internet, there are dozens of routing protocols operating for different levels of scale and different uses of the network. Uh, the routing that is used to route IP packets on backhaul fiber optic networks is different from the routing that is used within your office block to route packets um, within a switched environment. and That is how it should be. So um, when people say how surmountable are Lightning scaling challenges and is Lightning Network viable and does the routing scale, um, 
you know, that to me is a matter of engineering optimization, meaning that it is naive to say at this stage that because the routing that we have today doesn't scale to billions of nodes, that means that no routing can ever scale to billions of nodes or without centralizing the network or creating a hub and spoke system or destroying privacy, etc. etc. To say that it is not possible ever because it is not done today is to misunderstand how engineering works. And to me, I think this is an area of active research. The routing algorithm that exists today works for the Lightning Network that exists today. And one of the key tenets of engineering is you don't optimize something before it is necessary to optimize something. Premature optimization is a bad engineering practice. There is no reason to introduce or waste resources trying to build a routing algorithm today that scales to millions of nodes, when we have thousands of nodes. Um, because there are other, more interesting engineering problems to solve at this, problem, at this point. I would argue that issues of user interface design and ease of use for end users are far more important to solve at this stage of the Lightning Network. And solving problems of routing at scale will happen when it needs to happen, and not yet. Is the Lightning Network really viable? Yes, it is. It works today. And uh, I think there is far, far more research and development than most people realize happening in this exciting uh, space. So it's really important to understand that a transaction on Lightning Network, if you're doing a Bitcoin channel, is a Bitcoin transaction. Now imagine if I created a transaction. Um, and instead of broadcasting it on the Bitcoin blockchain, I signed the transaction and then gave it to you. And you can broadcast it whenever you want, or you can just hold on to it. Anytime you take that signed transaction and broadcast it, you get the outcome of that transaction. So we've exchanged the signed transaction, we just haven't broadcast it. That's how Lightning works. So Lightning payment channels are Parties exchanging signed Bitcoin transactions, and it has the exact same security and authentication and authorization qualities, the same security guarantees as the Bitcoin blockchain. In fact, that's why Lightning works because it requires the security of the underlying Bitcoin blockchain. Lightning is routing smart contracts, pre-signed Bitcoin transactions. And it needs those smart contracts, those pre-signed Bitcoin transactions, to be secure, to be valid on the underlying blockchain. It is not entirely true that the Lightning Network participants need to be online to execute transactions. They need to be online to start a transaction. So, for example, in order to create an invoice to be paid, they need to be online. And under some circumstances, they need to be online to monitor the channels. But they can also outsource the monitoring of channels to third parties. Keep in mind, Lightning Network is intended to be a live, small payment, fast network. It's not intended to be a batch, big transaction, long-term payments network. That is best done on-chain. In any Lightning Network scenario, if one of the parties um, fails to uh, finish the commitment to a channel, does not update their state, or does not close the channel when asked, then the other party uh, can close the channel by transmitting one of the prior states. The only way that balance can be pushed forward through the channel is if the parties share a hash pre-image, which is the secret for unlocking uh, hash time locked commitment. And in that case, um, the party uh, who has sent that balance uh, can also receive the same balance from the previous channel endpoint with the same secret. So you don't have to trust that any of the other parties participating in Lightning are going to behave as expected. In fact, the whole point of this 
is that you do transactions with people who are not expected to behave in any particular way. They may disappear. They may stop responding to channel requests. They may refuse to close a channel. They may refuse to forward a hash time locked contract. They may do whatever they want to do. It doesn't matter. You don't need to trust them because at every step of the way, you have a signed Bitcoin transaction that is valid that allows you to recover your funds. And that's the whole point. The whole point is that the network itself does not require trust between participants. How will the Lightning Network handle distributed denial of service attacks? Well, that really depends on what kind of distributed denial of service attacks we're talking about. In order to create a Lightning Network payment channel, uh, you have to commit funds, and that makes it difficult for someone to simply create uh, payment channels and, and not use those payment channels. Secondly, um, in order to propagate payments across payment channels, there usually is a small fee. And we'll see how that plays out and whether that will lead to di distributed denial of service attacks. Also, Lightning Network nodes, just like Bitcoin nodes, monitor the type of information they are receiving from adjacent nodes from their peers. And if they see that um, the information they are receiving is incorrect or invalid, they will limit the connection or potentially even ban the nodes that are misbehaving. All peer-to-peer -peer networks have to have some mechanism for protecting against misbehaving peers. And the most common way to do that is to either throttle or ban for a short period of time or potentially ban for a long period of time. So Lightning Network will handle distributed denial of service attacks in the same way that every peer-to-peer -peer network handles them. Uh, and that's an ongoing process because as each type of attack is handled, attackers come up with new ways to attack the network and that forces the network to adapt, which forces the attackers to adapt, which forces the network to adapt. And gradually, you evolve the system to become more and more resilient to denial of service attacks. Uh, Bitcoin itself is under denial of service attack all the time, and it gradually evolved to become quite strong and resilient against denial of service attacks. That doesn't mean they're impossible. It just means they're not very effective. They cost a lot of money to uh, execute, and they don't really do much. The same thing with the internet. Uh, TCP, IP, DNS, uh, HTTP, many other protocols and infrastructures on the internet have gradually evolved to handle bigger and bigger distributed denial of service attacks and become resilient. This is a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized network, which means that your own Lightning Network node connects to um, 10 or 15 other nodes and uses that to create a mesh network. So your node decides what nodes to connect to, and it decides whether it needs to ban one of its neighbors from misbehaving. So who bans nodes? Everyone bans nodes. If they start misbehaving, everyone who experienced that misbehavior will ban those nodes, and eventually they will not be able to connect to the network at all. That's how it works in Bitcoin. That's how it works in Lightning Network. There is no centralized authority here. Each node decides whether to ban its neighbors or not. Let's examine a couple of different ways uh, in which we see interoperability in these second layer protocols. The first one is um, the idea of the Lightning Network being an open protocol that can be implemented by a wide variety of companies that can produce interoperable clients, wallets, uh, merchant services, all kinds of other applications. All of these applications, lightning applications or LAPs, as they have now been called, um, can operate because of two fundamental layers of interoperability. The first one is a protocol level specification of how lightning works internally, which is called BOLT. B -O -L -T, Basics of Lightning Technology. You can find that on GitHub. Uh, the Lightning Dash RFC, so Lightning Dash RFC, which stands for Request for Comments, um, and that repository has, um, I believe, it's now twelve 
specifications called Bolt, Bolt 1 through Bolt 12. And each one of the Bolt documents specifies a specific aspect or, uh, of, of the Lightning Network, and specifies exactly how it should be implemented, so that there can be interoperability between clients. So, for example, um, one of the bolts specifies how um, hash time-locked contracts are implemented in terms of Bitcoin script. One of them implement, uh, talks about how um, messages are routed and how they are serialized on the li Lightning Network. One of the bolt specification talks about how different clients negotiate what capabilities they have. One of them is a basic implementation of a source routing gossip protocol. Um, and all of these different specifications are very much like internet RFCs that specify how email works on the internet or um, uh, how uh, FTP works, for example. All of those uh, specifications allow uh, developers to write a client, follow the specification, and arrive at a, a degree of interoperability. Now, as is the case with any specification written in a human language, um, the specification itself is not sufficient. Just because you have a specification doesn't mean you can write software that will interoperate immediately. And the reason for that is because human language has ambiguity. And that ambiguity, when you express it in software, means that every developer will you know, interpret things slightly differently. Um, maybe misunderstand some of the assumptions and write a slightly different implementation. Uh, I remember specifically in, in uh, my uh, first year of my postgraduate degree in uh, protocol design, one of the exercises that our uh, teachers gave us at university was to write an implementation of a transport layer protocol, uh, similar to TCP, but this was a different one, uh, the OSI stack one. Um, and we were each given the document, which was the TP4 implementation for this protocol, and said, "Go write." And so we wrote an implementation. We thought, "Oh, great! We finished the exercise." And then the professor said, "Great! Now make them work with each other." And um, we had to do a table where each of the students in the course uh, had their own implementation and across the top all of the other implementations, and then you put a cross mark if each of the features works in the table. None of them worked with each other, because we had all made different assumptions. And it was a very good lesson into why the specs don't necessarily mean interoperability. So what we've seen in this particular area of engineering is um, the Lightning Network uh, groups that are involved in this, um, which at the moment are uh, three primary development groups. The uh, Lightning Network Company, uh, which makes LND, um, and you may have heard of some of the people working there, uh, Elizabeth Stark, who was on a recent podcast with us, and uh, of course uh, Laolu, uh, also known as Roast Beef, uh, who is the lead developer and has done some amazing work in, in that company. Um, Async, which is a French company that makes a product called Eclair, uh, which is not the delicious pastry, but is in fact the name for lightning in French. And uh, the Blockstream uh, team that is implementing um, a client called C Lightning and the Lightning Charge uh, gateway for uh, e-commerce services. Those uh, three teams came together, implemented the Bolt specification, and once they all had something that they had agreed on after a big conference was compatible with Bolt, then they spent, I think it was three or four months of grueling interoperability testing, which is still ongoing today. The first time I tried to run uh, a version of LND against C Lightning on mainnet a couple of months ago, I discovered a couple of interoperability bugs and filed some bug reports, and those got fixed in the next iteration, etc. This is an ongoing effort. The more these various clients talk to each other, the smoother they get, the more interoperable they get. Um, and interoperability is something that is achieved only as a moving target. Because keep in mind, the underlying protocol is also changing. It's getting improved at the same time. So the Bolt specifications are getting improved. Um, and 
um, as changes happen to the specifications, then a whole new round of interoperability needs to happen. And these things will take a long time to, uh, to continue to evolve. Um, so that's what interoperability means. That's one layer. So interoperability at the protocol level between Lightning Network nodes that are uh, trying to open channels with each other, route payments to each other, and interoperate in that way. A second layer of interoperability is sort of the front-end user interfacing side, which involves how do you encode Lightning invoices as QR codes, etc., etc. What is the user experience so that regardless of which client you use, uh, you can use it together with other uh, Lightning Network clients. A third level of interoperability is the APIs, application programming interfaces, that allow various um, additional applications, wallets, user interfaces, merchant processing applications, etc., to interoperate um, with various uh, Lightning nodes. And these are usually done through some kind of RPC, Remote Procedure Call, or gRPC, which is the Google version of that. Uh, interface that allows a client, let's say a desktop wallet, to talk to a back-end node. Um, just like, for example, your wallet might talk to Bitcoin Core over an API. Um, and then finally, there is interoperability between blockchains. So right now, on the Lightning Network, there is support for two blockchains, Bitcoin and Litecoin. And one of the levels of interoperability is the ability to send a payment uh, in one currency and receive it in another currency. So essentially, um, have Lightning Network bridge Litecoin and Bitcoin. And I expect we're going to see many, many more currencies added as the Bolt specification is ported to other blockchains beyond Bitcoin and Litecoin. So that's interoperability. It's a moving target. It's a complex topic. It's happening at different layers simultaneously with lots of different teams working on different details within the protocol, and the protocol itself is changing. But um, you know, I think all of this complexity and all of this work that's going into interoperability really makes a joke of the idea that Lightning Network is controlled by one company or that it's a product of one company. It really is an open protocol with a lot of collaboration between a lot of teams with different interests trying to uh, build interesting applications with this technology.